Thank you, Rose. A beautiful song. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Joel, chapter 2? We're going to begin in verse 1 of Joel 2 in just a moment. Uh, sort of an announcement, an advertisement, you might say. We're six weeks from homecoming, so we're very excited about homecoming Sunday. Uh, I have invited Sebastian Carilla to come back and speak at the 11 o'clock service. I guess he's been away long enough. We can have him come back as our guest speaker. And uh, then in the afternoon, we have a special service that uh, we have planned. It's going to be around 1.30 after we finish eating. I know LD is going to help uh, organize this. But uh, many of you may not realize the building that we're in right now was built 70 years ago. The original building of Concord Baptist Church burned. And in 1954, this facility you're sitting in right now uh, was built to house the worship and also the instruction in the back and uh, downstairs in the fellowship hall. And many of you may remember when our fellowship hall was in the basement. But uh, we're going to have pictures. We're going to have information. We're going to have feedback uh, because next year is our 175th anniversary of the church and that's going to be very big. And so we're going to focus uh, that afternoon on uh, this building, some of the stories, some of the, our older members. We encourage you to be here, share what you remember, and then also getting our minds set toward next year when we celebrate 100. 75 years. So keep that in mind and plan on being with us for all the activities on Homecoming Sunday. Again, we're going to look in just a moment at Joel chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to look at the first 11 verses this morning. You know, if you are old enough, and, and many of you are, you likely remember what you were doing around 9 a.m. September 11th, 2001. It was about 14 or 15 minutes before that hour and that news came out that the North Tower, the first of the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, was struck uh, by an airplane. And then some 20 minutes later, the second tower also was struck. For many of you, you may remember exactly what you were doing. I do remember as if it were yesterday. I had taken uh, Doris Loveday's sister-in-law, Mary Stearns. We had different people that would volunteer a day or two out of the month to take her for her dialysis in Lynchburg. I just dropped her off at the dialysis center not far from Lynchburg General Hospital, and I had some time to kill, and I was going to hit the Christian bookstore and things like that while I was in Lynchburg. I turned my radio on. And at that time, I enjoyed listening to Q99. And if you ever listen to Q99, it's not talk radio. So when I turned it on and I heard that there was talking, I said, well, this is strange. And then I began to hear uh, described what happened in New York City. And really the first thing I said, this has got to be a farce. This can't be real. But sadly, uh, it was true. And when all was said and done that day, 2,977 people were killed at the site, some of whom were rescue workers, police officers, but it didn't stop there. It's been an estimated 2,000 other people who have died since because of the exposure to the toxicity that particular day. You know, that day could accurately be called uh, the worst uh, attack on the contiguous United States. And as we think about that, we remember what was happening, all of the lives that were lost. And, and, and there were so many feelings, as I remember the things of that day. There was the fear, what could be next? You were almost looking in the skies. There also was the feeling of protecting the children. You may remember that. That was the case with us. We were warned, be sure that your minor, your children do not see these things that, uh, that uh, uh, happened that particular day and, and there was just a feeling of violation and so as a nation we felt like someone whose house had been robbed but to be honest 
you could take what we felt as a nation and magnify that a hundred or a thousand times and you would get the feeling of violation, the feeling of hurt of those who were directly impacted, the family members of those who lost their lives, those who were seriously injured. You know, this morning we're continuing our study in Joel. And last week we saw what was actually a regional catastrophe. It affected in all likelihood thousands of people, but it was relegated, we see, to a specific area of Judah. And while it did not affect all of the known world in its particular day, to those who were in line of the fire of this locust judgment, it was a, a devastating thing. But today we're moving to chapter 2 and we're going to see the magnitude is stepping up. And we see that what is described here is a day in the future which is more expansive, more devastating, and more focused in judgment as compared to last week. Look with me at Joel chapter 2 beginning in verse 1, it says, Blow the ram's horn in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain, let all the residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, in fact it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and total darkness, like the dawn spreading over the mountains. A great and strong people appear, such as never existed in ages past, and never will again in all the generations to come. A fire devours in front of them, and behind them a flame blazes. The land in front of them is like the Garden of Eden, but behind them is like a desert wasteland. There is no escape from them. Their apparent appearance is like that of horses and they gallop like war horses. They bound on the tops of the mountains. Their sound is like the sound of chariots, like the sound of fiery flames consuming stubble, like a mighty army deployed for war. Nations writhe in horror before them. All faces turn pale. They attack as warriors attack. They scale walls as men of war do. Each goes on his own path, and they do not change their course. They do not push each other. Each proceeds on his own path. They dodge the arrows, never stopping. They storm the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter through the windows like thieves. The earth quakes before them. The sky shakes. The sun and moon grow dark and the stars cease their shining. The Lord makes his voice heard in the presence of his army. His camp is very large. Those who carry out his command are faithful. Indeed, the day of the Lord is terrible and dreadful. Who can endure it? Let's pray. Father, well, as we look at this very sobering chapter of the Bible, Lord, we know that there have been days of the Lord and that, Lord, there will be days of the Lord, but that, Lord, there also is coming the day, the ultimate time, God, when you will intervene in history. And so, Lord God, our study today, may it not only touch our hearts, I mean our minds, but may it touch our hearts. And if there be any here today who can honestly say they're not ready, I pray today would be the day of salvation, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the language and events here in Joel chapter 2 are very similar to what was described last week in Joel chapter 1. But I think it is very clear that this is not the same invasion that we studied last week. The, the description here in chapter 2, while similar in many ways to what's described in chapter 1, actually is distinct from it. It is a yet-to-be uh, devastation rather than than one that had already occurred. In other words, in verse 1 it says the day is coming. It will be a more comprehensive day, a more comprehensive day of judgment. Last week we looked at the locust judgment. We saw that. This is going to be more comprehensive where that was sort of focused on one region, one area. It says in verse 1 that all the residents will be in the, in the expanse of the sky as we see also um, in that. In verse 2, like the dawn spreading over the mountains. And it also is described here as an unmatched day. We see
see that in verse 2, and we see it's never existed before, and it will never again be in all the generations. And so this particular judgment that is prophesied and spoken about here in Joel chapter 2 is a future judgment that possesses some of the same attributes of the judgment we see in Joel 1, but a day in much greater magnitude and much greater devastation. I believe that this chapter speaks to a day that is beyond even our day, that although Joel wrote this um, hundreds of years ago, hundreds of years before Christ came, I believe that he's pointing that God has given him this prophecy for a day that is future even to you and to me. And using the images and in the context that's been set in chapter 1 of this locust invasion, we see that God is expressing through Joel this day that is going to be a devastating day of judgment for the world, a dreadful day. Now this morning and next week, uh, we're going to look at mainly two points. I wanted to include both of them today, but I'll be honest, it was too much to deal with in one day, so we're going to divide our look. Today we're going to look at the nature of the coming judgment, and we just saw that in verses 1 through 11. Next week, we're going to look at the nature of the controlling judge. So the nature of the coming judgment we'll study today, but very importantly, next week, we're going to look at the nature of the controlling judge. So first, look with me at this coming judgment described in verses 1 through 11. You know, last week as we studied uh, the judgment of the locusts in chapter 1, we noted that God is sovereign over all. We noted how God can use a minute part of his creation, the locust, an army put together and send his judgment. He can carry out his will in his judgment. Do you realize that God is sovereign over all? that he's the one that awakened you today. He's the one who controls all that is happening around us. He controls our nation. He controls this world. Well, the scripture says that there is a coming day. Now, when we look at this word day, day can mean uh, various things. It can mean a 24-hour period. In this context, though, it speaks to a period of time, a, a period of time. It doesn't have to be an expansive period of time, but a period of time. You know, some of us who are older, we say, yeah, back in the day, we used to do this, and we'll use the term to refer to a particular time period. Now, I believe this isn't an expansive time period of hundreds of years, but it is more than just a 24-hour day, but it is a time centered around the second coming of Jesus Christ. And like a storm that we might see moving from the west, this day, as each day passes, is moving closer and closer to us. And the day of the Lord we talked about last week in the Old Testament specifically speaks of a day of judgment. But we can look at it in the entirety of Scripture in this. It is a day when God directly intervenes in history. Well, I want to know four characteristics of this coming day. And, and they are found right here in the Scripture. The first is this. It will be unprecedented. This day will be unprecedented. Last week when we studied about the day of the Lord, and it's a, a theme uh, throughout this tiny book of Joel, we see that there are four aspects, or when the day of the Lord is spoken, really four things can be addressed. One would be a past event. For instance, we could look back at the Exodus and say, that was the day of the Lord. That was a day when God directly intervened in history. Last week we looked in Joel chapter 1, a judgment, I believe, that was for the contemporaries of of Joel and how that day of the Lord was a present reality. There also in Joel speaks of a future day of the Lord, not a day of judgment, but a day of pouring out of the blessing at the end of Joel chapter 2. That would be God sending, or referencing God sending the Holy Spirit at Pentecost as described in the book of Acts. But then there is that ultimate day of the Lord. In these first three, we see that God himself has acted directly and clearly in history. But in this ultimate day of the Lord, God is going to do things that are unparalleled. This day is in our future. It's going to be when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. As sure as I'm standing here, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to bodily return to this earth. And I believe that Joel chapter 2 is describing the events that surround 
that significant event of Jesus' return. Uh, so you say, well, how, how can we distinguish this from uh, the other days of the Lord or, or what we read last week? Well, look at the end of verse 2. It, well, let's go through all of verse 2. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and total darkness, like the dawn spreading over the mountains, a great and strong people appears. And then look at this. It says, such as never existed in ages past and never will again in all the generations to come. In other words, this cannot be speaking of the judgment in Joel chapter 1. And I realize I'm using an argument from silence, but I've tried to study not only biblical history, but the history uh, of that particular time. And there's no clear reference to when this judgment in Joel 1 happened. Why might that be? I tend to think it was a regional particular judgment that maybe was not worldwide, that wasn't considered to be newsworthy or noteworthy to historians of that day. We know that it happened because the scripture said that it happened, but we also know this, it's not the same of what's being described in chapter 2 because it says here that it will be so noteworthy that nothing in the past was ever like it and nothing in the future will be like it. Look with me quickly at Matthew chapter 24 four and verse 21. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. <clears throat> this is Jesus' Olivet Discourse where he's speaking about his return. And in Matthew chapter 24 uh, and verse 21, he says this, for at that time there will be great distress, the kind, notice what it says, that hasn't taken place from the beginning of world of the world until now and never will again. Sounds very similar. The same thing that is said here in Joel chapter 2 is said about this future day, the day of the Lord, Christ coming, and the events that surrounding it, that it is unmatched. And so God is saying to us, even now, turn with your own heart. He's calling us to turn to him. Why is that? Because this day will be unprecedented in scope. Look at verse 1. Let all the residents of the land tremble. And then in verse 3, we see, or uh, verse 2, there's something that's very interesting. He sort of mixes his simile here. He says, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and total darkness, like the dawn spreading. Now, dawn and darkness are different. Well, in the first part, when he speaks of, of the darkness and the gloom, he's speaking of uh, the substance or the characterization of that particular day. It is going to be a devastating and dark day. But when he mentions the dawn spreading over the mountains, that speaks to the exhaustive nature of it, that, that it's going to be just as you look from the eastern uh, sky from where the dawn comes all the way across. In other words, it's going to be expansive. It's going to be vast. This is going to hit all of the worlds like the all of the world like the dawn spreading over the mountains. But not only will it be unprecedented in its scope, it is going to be unprecedented in effect. There will never be a day like it. We're speaking of this great tribulation, the last half of the seven-year period of tribulation. It's going to be devastating. Darkness is going to abound. Suffering is going to be, there's going to be um, all types of military unrest throughout the world. There are going to be cosmic displays of the judgment of God. It says in verse 2, it will cause the people to tremble. It will be a day of darkness. You say, well, hey, I can handle the dark. Try living in darkness day after day after day after day. No light. It's going to be a tormentful day. The earth will quake. It says in verse 10, the sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will cease. There's going to be cosmic disturbance on this day. And then it says in verse 11, the last half, indeed, the day of the Lord will be terrible and dreadful. Who can endure it? And so we see the magnitude of this judgment in scope and in judgment itself will be unprecedented. Do you realize that's coming? As surely as I'm standing here, the Lord is going to come back and, and his rule is going to be clear. And around that, there's going to be worldwide judgment of people who have rejected him, who have not trusted him. But I want you to see a second truth. It will be unexpected. 
In other words, people will not be looking for it. Look at verse 1. Blow the ram's horn in Zion. Zion representing uh, Jerusalem, the holy city in Jerusalem. Now horns really did, the blowing of horns accomplished two things in biblical times. One, uh, if you had a feast, there would be the blowing of the horns and it would introduce the beginning of the feast. It would get the attention of the people. But also it would announce coming danger. Picture this, people are living their lives and then all of a sudden we see the judgment of God comes. We have um, a precedent for that in the days of Noah. Look again at Matthew chapter uh, 24. I should have told you to keep your place there. Matthew 24 and verse 36, we see the unexpected nature of that day of the Lord when God judged the earth in the days of Noah. People had seen Noah building the ark and I'm sure they didn't take it seriously, but there came a time when they did. Now look at verse 36 of Matthew 24. Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son except the Father alone, as the days of Noah were. So the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. It will be an unexpected day. People may have heard about it and they disregarded it. Look at, at um, verse 12. We're going to look at it uh, next week, but I think it's important for us to look at it this week. It's the first verse we'll look at next week, but it says, even now, this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart. Hey, don't wait for the flood of God's judgment. And I speak about that metaphorically because this world will not come to an end by water. It's going to come, I believe, an end by fire. God promised that it wouldn't. That rainbow you see in the sky, the colors of the rainbow, that's not some social group or political group. That is God's rainbow. God said he would not destroy uh, the world by water. And to this point, it's never happened. God keeps his word. So when you see that rainbow, not only is it a beautiful thing, it as a testament to the faithfulness of God that, that he keeps his word. Well, that same God is speaking through Joel and is saying, even now, turn your heart to me. Even now, don't wait. Don't take the risk. You may not walk out of here alive. You may walk out of here alive tomorrow, not live next week. Even now, turn to me is what God's word is saying. It's going to be unexpected. And so it's better to be ready. It's better to be ready than to wait for something that we may not expect in the future. A, a lot of you, you, you hear those noises that come every week. This is a test, a test from the emergency broadcast system. You're listening to your favorite song on the radio or your favorite speaker, and all of a sudden you hear this boop, and then it goes like that. I saw a couple of you jump when I did that. <laughs> That's what I do. And then all of a sudden it goes boop, 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 and then you're like waiting and everything's silent. And then a minute they say, this was a test. Have you ever thought, maybe this isn't a test? I've thought it. In fact, when it, when it does that, I'm thinking, is this going to be a period of silence? And five or 10 seconds later, they're going to say this was only a test? Or are they going to give instruction? God is saying here, blow the horn in Zion. Listen, it's coming. Don't, don't, hey, we can tune out those EBS, those emergency broadcast system, either turn them down because they get on our nerves or ignore them, but they're there for a purpose that in the future when it happens, you better be alert. God's word is warning us. There's coming a day. Are you alert? But I want you to see not only will it be unexpected, but this day will be irrepressible. It will not be stopped. God uses the imagery of locusts in this tiny book. And locusts are interesting part of creation. In fact, you can um, look up the word locust in the Bible and you can see how they describe armies. You can see some of the unique characteristics of uh, this creature. Uh, but the people here would be familiar with locusts because of the judgment in Joel chapter 1. Now the army that is mentioned here that is so numerous in chapter 2, it may be a man-made army. It could be a, a natural occurrence 
We don't know exactly. There's a lot of symbolism that is used uh, throughout the Bible, but we know literally what it's going to be, and it's going to be unstoppable. Whatever the agent is that God chooses to use, it will be unstoppable. In a couple of weeks, or rather a couple of weeks ago in Jeremiah chapter 27, uh, we saw we were two weeks in Jeremiah, it was the second of the weeks, and God was saying to the people, this is going to happen. Uh, Babylon's going to come, going to overthrow you. You better just give in to it. In other words, this train is moving. It's not stopping. You better comply with it. Even in a much greater way, this this coming day, this judgment of God on the world cannot be stopped. Listen, God doesn't like a lot of what's happened in the world today. There's a lot of sinfulness. There's a lot of pride. There's a lot of arrogance. There's a lot of, of, of uh, promoting lifestyles that are unacceptable to God. And we expect that God's just going to sit down and gently swallow all of it. He's not happy and his wrath will come. And when that day comes, it will not be and cannot be stopped. Look at, at verse 7. In fact, I like the imagery in all of it. Let, let's look at... Uh, uh, verses 4 through 7. Their appearance is like that of horses. They gallop like war horses. They bound on the tops of the mountains. Their sound is like the sound of chariots, like the sound of fiery flames, consuming stubble, like a mighty army deployed for war. Nations rise in horror before them. All faces turn pale. Now look at verse 7. They attack as warriors attack. They scale as men of war do. Each goes on his own path and they do not change their course. It speaks of the devouring in verse 3. It's like the land is like Eden before this army of judgment comes and after it, it's like a desert wasteland. In other words, this army will be irrepressible. It cannot be stopped. They dodge the arrows, never stopping. They do not change their course. We studied Paul a couple of months ago. And when that offering was received, he determined he would, in spite of all of the warnings of the prophets, he was going to bring to completion that offering. Well, how much more will God bring to a completion this particular day that will be in judgment? In fact, the Bible speaks of it being a day as when the woman was in birth pains, leading up to that day, how that would point to the birth and the event that would happen. This terrible day is in the sovereign hand of God. He has already determined when it will be. And it is certainly coming and will not be stopped. You know, I love amusement parks. Um, I love roller coasters. I just don't like the ones where your head gets below your feet. I think if God wanted that to be, he would have given us heads for feet and feet for heads. But I don't mind how fast they go. I just don't like to be turned upside down. It just doesn't sit well with me. But if you've ever been to an amusement park and you've been on a roller coaster or a parent of a child for the first time on a roller coaster, you know that sound, click. And when that sound click, you're locked in. When that thing starts moving, I don't care how old a man you are, if you're wailing, that train ain't stopping. It's not stopping. You're locked in. Listen, this day will not be stopped. It is irrepressible. As sure as the next coaster that's coming in line, this day is going to come. It is irrepressible. God has determined it. He has determined it. That's why you need to trust Jesus now. But I want you to see a final thing. This day it will be ordered and orderly. I laughed, uh, children's camp, the um, penultimate day, it's, it's Thursday afternoon. Um, they have what is called organized mass chaos. Now, that doesn't make sense, right? Organized chaos. Those, that, those terms conflict. But it actually is organized mass chaos. I've seen it. 
basically what they do is they plan chaos. They, in other words, they get shaving cream, they get all types of crazy stuff. They have a large field bigger than our recreation field, probably two times the size, maybe three. They put four or 500 kids, they give them all types of crazy tasks, water, shaving cream, and everything. And when it's over, people are drenched, people have shaving cream all over them, and I'm trying to dodge all of it. I notice I didn't visit this year during OMC. <laughs> But you say it's chaos, but it was planned. There was shaving cream that was purchased. There was water that was set, water balloons maybe. It was chaos, but it was planned. And thus it was organized chaos. Listen, God is the orchestrator of all of history. It's going to happen. It's going to be orderly. And everything that he does, that he ordains, everything is intentional and purposeful. Now, for humanity, it may seem chaotic, but God has ordered it, and God is working out his purpose. Notice the order of that day. I like verses 4 and 5. It's like that of horses, multiple horses. They gallop. They bound on the top of mountains. In other words, it's like an army. It's like an army that is being deployed uh, for war. And we see all of the metaphors here, the locusts, the army, the horses, all of these things. And it's interesting how they relate. In other words, Karen and I were reading in Proverbs chapter 30 uh, this week about four things that are incredibly small but extremely wise and impressive. Guess what made the list? The locusts. How did the locusts make the list? It says they have no king, yet all of them march in order. In other words, there is an order to it. Notice what it says there. Whether it's speaking of the literal locusts or may well have been an army, it's speaking to the fact that this day is, is, is purposeful. It says that of, of this army that is judging, notice what it says, uh, verse 7, the latter part of the verse, each goes on his own path. They do not change their their course. They do not push each other. Each proceeds on his own path. They dodge the arrows, never stopping. In other words, like a well-oiled machine, a well-orchestrated choir, a well-directed military group, this day is happening in God's order, in God's plan, and God is the commanding officer. He's the orchestra leader. He's the machinist. He's directing all of this to accomplish his purpose, which is what? To bring this world as we know it to an end and bring in a beautiful new world with Christ and God the Father, the Holy Spirit in control. So we see a clear depiction here of this coming day it's going to be a day that is unprecedented. Hey, we look out, we say, oh man, it's hot, it's terrible. We say it's terrible as whatever here. Hey, none of this is going to compare to what we see during that day that is described here. It is going to be unmatched. The torture, the agony. Could you imagine never having daylight for, for the sun being taken away and, and not being able to see, feeling claustrophobic, whatever, feeling wrath, whatever. All of these feelings along with the suffering, it's going to be unprecedented. It's going to be unexpected. Many people, most people won't know when it hits. It's going to hit in spite of the warnings of Scripture. There are going to be people unprepared. And when it happens, it's irrepressible. It's not going to be stopped. God's judgment will happen. And it is ordered and orderly, working out His purpose. You say, how could a God, a loving God, do that? Well, stick with us next week, and you're going to see. But let me give you a little preview. God loves you and me enough that he gives us the warning in Scripture. God's a debtor to no one. He owes us nothing. We owe him everything. God loves us. He awakened us today in our right mind. He loves us enough to say this is going to happen. I want you to be aware of it. It's important for you to be ready. But it's your decision. Will you trust him? You know, God is reliable. I, I use a term when I speak of people that are, are reliable, and it's a quality we don't often focus on that's a great quality of God, reliability. When I say a person's reliable, I, I say they're money in the bank. You can count on them. 
Think about this. Every day of your life, the sun rises, the sun sets, this earth rotates on its axis. God does it faithfully, continually. For me, it's been 21,700 days that have happened just the same because God is reliable. Every word he has prophesied either has already happened, many of which have happened, or will happen. Every rainbow, as we saw, that appears in the sky is a testament to a God who faithfully said, although in the days of Noah this earth was destroyed by water, it will not again. And to this point, it's proven true. And I tell you, God's money in the bank, it will always prove true. Think about Jesus himself. Three times before he died with his disciples, he predicted that he would be turned over to the authorities, he would be killed, and he would rise again. And it happened just as he said. God is money in the bank. What he says will happen. And he tells us here in Joel chapter 2, there's a coming day that's going to be a terrible day of judgment for many but by the grace and mercy of God. And we're going to look at the characteristics of the one who controls all of this next week. His desires that you be saved. You trust him. You believe him. You put yourself in his arms, in his power, in his care. He's faithful. The God who predicts all of this has said, if you would believe on him, you would be saved. And if you're saved, there's nothing that can happen that can touch you eternally. You're good with him. That's why Jesus died and rose again to give that to you. Let's pray. Father, as we have looked at this coming day, a day that Joel tells us is unprecedented. Never has there been a day like it will be and never will there be a day likened to it. Father, we know that you're very serious that, Lord, the rejection of people, the, the lifestyles and the attitudes that are ungodly, um, Lord, you're not just bypassing those things. But, Father, we thank you that by your grace you have provided forgiveness to those who would repent and turn to Jesus Christ. I pray today the alarm is sounding. I pray today that people now would say, I want to be in the arms of the one who controls it all, who loves me, who will protect me. And Lord, we know that you'll see us through whatever. And at the end, Lord, we'll stand. We place our trust in you and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.